Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Titans of Food Service podcast. I'm your host, Nick Portillo, and today we have a special guest who is transforming the education and non-commercial space through his groundbreaking initiatives. Joining us today is Marlon Gordon. Messed up his name. <clears throat> welcome back to another. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Titans of Food Service podcast. I'm your host, Nick Portillo, and today we have a special guest who is transforming the education and non commercial space through his groundbreaking initiatives. Joining us today is Marlon Gordon, the founder and CEO of Next Gen Network, a creative marketing agency built on relationships and fueled by a passion for storytelling and innovation. Marlon and his team are on a mission to bring value and captiv captivating content to the forefront, igniting a movement of collaboration and community. Next Gen Network hosts an array of learning events that are making waves within our industry. From the groundbreaking digital magazine for K-12, called Served Digizine to the revolutionary platform known as First Taste TV, showcasing cutting edge products and technologies transforming the dining experience. Marlon's team is pushing boundaries and redefining what's possible. And let's not forget about From the Show Floor, where they bring the excitement of food shows right to your screen, making, making it accessible to everyone, regardless of their location. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Marlon's passion truly comes alive with Ignite, an event that goes beyond mere collaboration and innovation. It's a movement that brings together vendors, operators, and the next-gen network to ignite the power of partnerships and build relationships that drive progress in our industry. Through Indulge, Marlon and his team have harnessed the power of video marketing, recognizing its immense value in building trust, showcasing products, and connecting with consumers on a deeper, more tangible level. They've embraced the challenge of the pandemic head on, propelling video marketing to new heights and opening doors for businesses around the world. And last but certain, certainly not least, next up, their captivating talk show that dives deep into the minds of visionaries and thought leaders, providing an engaging platform for insightful discussions that inspire and educate. Today, I have the privilege of, I have the privilege of taking a deep dive into Marlon's world and discovering how next, next gen network is shaping the landscape of food service within education and the non-commercial sector. We'll explore the power of storytelling, the value of relationships, and the innovative solutions that Marlon and his team bring to the table. So without further ado, let's welcome Marlon to the show. All right, Marlon, welcome to the Titans of Food Service podcast. I'm so excited to have you on here today. I appreciate you taking time to meet with me. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for having me on here. I mean, when I when I saw the email come through, I was like, oh my gosh, he thinks I'm a Titan of food service? This is great. <laughs> I, can't miss, I can't miss an opportunity to chat. Exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> let's start off. So I, I like to start off with all of my guests of how did you get into the food industry? Wow, how did I get into the food industry? Um, I guess with a little bit of luck and a blessing. <laughs> uh so I actually, I started off working in a school district in Florida on the IT side. So um, I, w I was never a chef. I never, never was a cook. I wasn't a food service operator ma or a restaurant owner. Like I started off running a team of technicians that handle everything food service related for a school district, which is kind of uncommon. Um, in the uh, K-12 world, most school districts don't even have, or most child nutrition programs in school districts don't even have their own tech person. They normally share it with, uh, with the rest of the district. But here in Florida, we have larger districts. And at my particular district, um, I oversaw a team of three people. And we handled everything from the point of sale, so the for like front of house, back of house, vending machines, uh, the communication software, typical help desk stuff, servers and all of that. So I spent about uh, four years at the school district at Pasco County, shout out to Pasco, um, under the great Julie Hadeen, uh, love her to death. Um, and she actually allowed me to grow. I'm naturally introverted. Um, people never believe me when I say that, unless you've known the old Marlin, but I am, I am truly an introvert, but I can turn yeah. it on when I need to. Right. 
Uh, so Julie allowed me to realize this about myself, allowed me to grow. Um, and it's so funny, like all the stuff that I'm doing right now, I actually did that back then at the district office, like all the TV shows and like, like all that stuff. Like it was, she allowed me to take chances and, and, uh, be innovative. But, uh, I spent four years at the district and then I accepted a position with a, one of my vendors at the time, they made me an offer. I couldn't refuse. So myself and the family moved up to uh, North Augusta, South Carolina, and I, I was working in, uh, in sales. So we actually sold um, software to school districts, and it was menu software, so like digital signage, um, mobile app, that sort of thing. And I spent four years working for this company. It was amazing. I had the chance to travel all around the country, meet a ton of amazing people, and provide solutions for them. But I realized quickly that I don't really like being told what to do. And the corporate lifestyle really wasn't for me um, because I related so much to the food service operator. And when you're working for a big corporation, a lot of it is about the stockholders and shareholders and all that stuff. But me, I'm like, no, nah, man, I was like, what about my people? Right. So um, nothing like no harsh feelings against this company because they were amazing. Right? I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them, too. Uh, but uh, I spent four years there. And then I was like, you know what? I think it's time to start a side gig. So I started a side gig and that was an action innovators. And um, I ended up leaving my corporate job in January of 2019, which is right before the pandemic happened. <laughs> That's tough to do. Yeah. And, and, but how could you foresee something like that, you know? Oh, yeah. No way. There's absolutely no way you could have. Yeah. So what made you, well, it, it's funny you mentioned the, the introvert part is I feel the same, definitely in a sales. So a little background on myself, my dad and I, we own our own uh, food service brokerage company. We're here in California, Nevada and Hawaii. So definitely a very sales forward job that we both have. He's definitely naturally an, in, an extrovert, but I'm an, an introvert. I like to think of myself as an extra extroverted introvert. I say that all uh, the time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So like when I'm at work, like I can turn it on all day, but then on the weekends, let's say like a good example would be when I go to a wedding and you know, there's a lot of people there obviously, and it takes extra energy and effort to have the small talk with people. And sometimes I like to just, can I just kind of hide away in the corner a little bit? So my personal persona versus my professional one is much different. And it's interesting how I can go back and forth between the two. I can 110% relate. I get it. I get it. And it's, it's funny because like uh, a lot of times, like when I get home from an event or home from travel or whatever it is, like I just need that time to decompress because so much has been like sucked out of me. And like it's it's fine in the time and I like it in the time. But like when I get home, I, I just need time to like recover. So I totally get it. I'm the same way as you. And I'm also um, an only child as well, so I'm incredibly independent. And it was fun. I went out to the fancy food show recently in New York, and I was there by myself. And one night, I there's a restaurant called Balthazar, which is a pretty, uh, it's a nice restaurant there. And I was like, I, I gotta go, but I'm just by myself, and I don't know what it's gonna be like. But oh well, I'm just gonna go sit there and see what it's all about. So I sat there in a in a crowded restaurant. I mean, it was a big restaurant all by myself. But I was like, you know what? It's I can manage this. It's not a big it's deal. Nice. I sat, I shared a booth with two other parties of people and they probably thought, you know, what's wrong with this guy. They brought out a complimentary glass of champagne right when I sat down and nobody else had that. I was like, they just think something happened here. But now I'm perfectly <laughs> comfortable just sitting there and minding my own business. Yeah. So I was an only child for 15 years of my life. And then my brother Michael wow. came along. So I, I think that affected me professionally. Like, I'm a lone wolf, but I love to have a pack at the same time. So it's like going back and forth. Like I can do both. Like I'm fine going to a restaurant or a bar, sitting there by myself or traveling by myself or like working a conference by myself. But sometimes I like running with the pack and that's what I'm kind of known for doing. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Totally. Totally. Well, let's talk about that. So next gen innovators, that's, I think that's what you mentioned was kind of the first iteration of where you're at here today what did that look like back then yeah so next gen innovators was more like marketing and consulting work 
Um, I wasn't able to do anything on the IT side just because of I didn't want to create any sort of conflict of interest with my current company I was working with, but my background was in IT. Um, so I actually got started providing um, social media support. Um, we used to do logo design. But I think the big thing, and this was partially strategy too, was I wanted to get involved in professional development. Now, I'm not, like, I'm not the smartest person in the world, right? That's not me. But I just happen to know a, a bunch of really smart individuals. And people would ask me all the time, well, hey, do you have a speaker for this conference? Or who could do this training? Or who do you know that can do this over here? And I never wanted to pretend to be something that I'm not. So I kind of built a team around me of people that were way smarter than me. And those same people, they can educate, they can inspire. But on top of that, they also made really good references. So whenever their school districts or people that they were working with need to help with marketing, they would refer them to me. Um, and that's kind of how I got started. And one of those individuals, her name is Amanda Venenzio. And Amanda came to me in, uh, it was in March or probably April of 2019, after the pandemic began. She was somebody that um, I used to place in speaking engagements. So she used to, I set her up with a keynote that passed January in Illinois, and um, it was a challenge. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, it was just a challenging job, but we found a way to make it work. Like we, we pretty much, we feel like we saved the day. And that's why when she came to me, she was like, Marlon, you were the only person I know that's crazy enough, and innovative enough to take the chance with me on this idea that I have. And I was like, well, what's the idea? Like, I'm, I'm intrigued. Let me know. And it was something it was a it was a TV show, essentially. And that's what became First Taste TV, which was the first thing that we launched. So that's when I kind of pulled back on Next Gen Innovators and I started a new company called Next Gen Presents. And we launched First Taste TV. And that is uh, that was our solution for the pandemic when industry members could not get in front of operators anymore because shows were canceled, right? But they still had a bunch of solutions they wanted to offer, um, products to sell and that sort of thing. So our idea was let's take home shopping network and then combine that with food network and then gear that programming, that episode towards operators in the food service. And uh, we partnered with a company called S Rock that first year out of Chicago. Kevin Wilson, thank you so much for your help. Um, and uh, yeah, we we filmed. I think it was fifteen episodes in the first year, and then uh, um, gosh, yeah, it was fifteen epi uh, fifteen episodes that first season. And we planned this whole thing within like four or so months. And uh, we had people on there like Tyson. We had General Mills. The production team was the same team that you that did Dateline NBC. We filmed in the studio. It was really, really neat. And it was a lot of work and a ton of fun. And that was like our big splash into the, the industry. And then that's when I learned that, hey, uh, you're kind of a, an idea guy. And I kept having more and more and more and more ideas. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been amazing ever since. What was <clears throat> when you were coming from your job into the next gen innovators you, you mentioned it was kind of a side hustle to start what, what was the point where you said okay i can do this full time now and take the risk and make the leap <laughs> so i don't think i've ever publicly spoke about this but uh there was a company out there <clears throat> that was following what i was doing and they were like hey man you need to like go full time and make this your full-time gig you want to support you how can we help and after some time, I was like, look, guys, I was like, I appreciate your support, but it's just money. Like I have a wife and three kids. Like I, I need to pay the bills. And right now I'm not generating the funds to do that. So they're like, oh, God, that's no problem. We're going to invest. Let's talk to the attorneys and the accountants and do all the paperwork. And we're going to make it happen. And I was like, great. Like I finally get to, to go out and do this like entrepreneur thing I keep hearing about. And uh, when the pandemic hit, that money vaporized, disappeared. Um, they were kind of dragging me along for a bit and I was like, we went through this whole, like this whole show thing, this whole pony and dance show for the past eight months. And then the pandemic hits and you guys are just gone. And it wasn't even a ton of money that they were going to give me, but it was enough to get me started for, for the next like eight months to a year essentially. But, um, everything happens for a reason, a reason. And that was a blessing in disguise. And we were able to launch a company with like, we're, we're self-funded, like fully self-funded at this point. 
So I'm glad it didn't happen because then they would have owned me. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that worked out well. You know, there's it, it's it's a silver lining for sure. Yeah, yeah. But then we did uh, first taste TV, and I was like, oh, that, that was a lot of fun. But you know, it's kind of expensive because this is almost like a national show. Like the, in the quality of the product, it was all like national, big budget. And I was like, what about the smaller regional people? And I like the brokers out there, right? You guys operate in a That's certain right. region. I was like, what about the brokers? How can we help them out? How can we work with state associations? Like, I'm all about helping other people. Like, I, I think of myself as like a rocket booster, and I just want to boost people up and then fall off and watch them do their thing, right? Like, get them to the moon, and then I'm done. I want to, I want to be there for the ride. So um, after that, we did this thing called From the Show Floor. And from the show floor was a project that we partnered with the school nutrition um, or New York School Nutrition Association and 10 other state associations, because the whole idea was, how can we make something for the more regional companies that's not super expensive that we could actually execute on? So whereas with First Taste TV, we did 15 episodes over three days with from the show floor, we did 47 episodes over three days. And that was brutal in a good way, though. But 47 episodes, right? So what we did was we had our cameras and audio lighting, all stuff set up. And it was supposed to mimic being in the show floor. Like this wasn't like a a studio production. We were mimicking being at a trade show. So each company would put together, put together their booth off screen or offset and then come drop in front of the camera. We film for like 10, 15 minutes. They go on. The next company comes, drops in their booth, film for 10, 15 and then they move on. And it was so much that um, by by the time day three hit, we had to bring in a masseuse for everybody. We had mimosas set up for our clients and for us. Like it, it kind of turned into a party. But I never thought holding a microphone like this could be so difficult three days straight. Like oh, yeah. talking about knots in your back and everything. It was it was rough, but it was it was a learning experience. And we got to help 47 different companies out. So it was it was a lot of fun and 11 state associations. And I'm sure being a dad, you know, holding your kids up, you know, in one arm, you know, for long periods of time, like he could yeah. build good muscles doing the same thing with a mic. Um, <laughs> they're just a fraction of the weight. You know what? I never thought about that. When, when I used to hold the kids when they were babies, it was always the left arm, but I hold the mic with my right, which makes no sense. Uh, I probably should have put the mic in my left arm. I would have been fine the whole time. <laughs> when I, you just even out your, uh, uh, your muscles, which is, I guess that's a positive, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> When you first start off with the TV show, how did you, how did you generate your first dollar from that? Like, what was it that, or, or yeah, how did that happen? Uh, by selling my, my hopes and my dreams. So it was pretty much, and you know what, like all the relationships that I built being an operator working in the school district, and then the relationships that I was able to build being on the industry side, t- traveling around and, and meeting and hanging out with other industry members, like that is the only reason why I believe, other than the good idea, that first first ACB actually took off because like we were nobody. We had nothing at all. This was literally just an idea. So I just had to pitch my idea. And a few of them said yes. A whole lot of them said no. Um, but yeah, it was literally just selling this, this thought that I had. So. Wow, that's impressive. That's pr- so. You go from starting a TV show to from the show floor. Where do you go from there? What What are kind of the the next steps after that? And are you still yeah. doing the TV show? Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, so next steps was oh my gosh, we have all this content. What are we going to do with it, right? And um, uh, <laughs> I was like, well. I used to work in a school district and when I worked in the school district, I would get this magazine, but I would never really read it. I would look for pictures unless myself or like one of my friends wrote an article. And I was like, when I was on the industry side, I used to purchase advertising and do those sorts of things, but I never really saw any real return on investment. And at this point, I kept hearing from industry members, ROI, ROI, ROI. And I was like, well, how do we increase their ROI? So I was like, you know what? Oh, my wife actually had the idea. I, sometimes I take credit for it accidentally, but it was really her idea. Um, she was like, Marlon, well, you're a huge nerd and you watch Harry Potter. And in Harry Potter, the newspapers, they have videos in them. They come to life. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what if we created a digital publication or a digital magazine and we call it a digizine and then we can make it more engaging because 
the ads could actually come to life. We could have videos in them. They could be gifts. We could put in podcasts. We can do all sorts of different things. And then if it's digital, we could actually track analytics. Because like with a paper pub- publication, you can't, you can't click on anything, right? You can't download it. You can't check open rates and all that. I was like, well, if we have a digital publication, we can do all that. We're going to make a digital and it's going to be our communication platform for everything, right? So that's when Served came to be. And we call it Served because it's meant to be for all of education. And as of right now, we are... So we started off in K-12 because that's just our bread and butter. That's where we all came from. But we, we made sure to leave ED in there so we can um, branch out to colleges and universities which is what we're getting ready to do like right now. So served was the, uh, was the next idea in the line. And when someone reads served, what are some of the deliverables that you're giving to them? Or what are some, what's some of the value that they get from reading served? Yeah. So uh, we like to say you don't just read served. You can read, watch, or listen to it. Um, but it's, it's a publication that's written by um, food service operators and industry written by the industry for the industry, right? So it's not just a team of editors that we have writing all these articles. Like we actually have like the people that are boots on the ground actually doing the work, creating some of the content for us, whether it's a written article, whether it's an interview that we filmed on site, whether it's a podcast that they came in to do. And then we like to, of course, we, we include stuff that we do as well. So all of our first Taste TV episodes go in there. All of our next up episodes go in there. That's our, our talk show that we can get into later. Um, podcast, but then we like to share what other people are doing too. So I'm going to put this podcast in there, right? I'm going to put the podcast in there that I did with the peanut board a couple days ago. Like I'm, I'm going to put school nutrition associations podcast in it also, because there are a lot of people doing some really cool things that need to be shared. Um, cause you need some more inspiration and more innovation in the world. And I, I want to be someone that could help do that, help provide that, even if it's not me. And for those listening too, I've actually gone through some of your your digizines and it is very interactive and every time i'd scroll to another page there'd be like a video and then immediately there you know the sound would start and the visuals it's very well done and i've not seen anybody especially in the food industry do something like this so kudos to you and your team yeah i mean it's really the team i I tell people all the time i'm just the idea guy they're the executioners So, so i get these wild ideas and they're somehow able to make them come to life, which I am so thankful for. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. For when I first started out, or when my dad and I we first started our business, it was him and I doing everything from the sales and marketing to the operations to the accounting to all these different business functions. And I'm like, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I'll I'll try and put as much time and energy. And then as the business grows, you find other people around you that are way better in that business function, whatever specific it is, and you just let them run with it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me about the, you mentioned a talk show. Now, what is that? Yeah. So uh, that's kind of a funny story. I was talking to Tyson and it was the first time that we had started to feel the pinch of the pandemic. And I'm like, man, I was like, we're not looking good for this for the upcoming few months. Like I got to get some, some work on the books. Right. So we're we're chatting, and uh, uh, the the Tyson rep was like, "Hey, Mar-, he's like, hey man, like we just don't have chicken right now. Like we, I can't buy ads because we don't have product because we were in the middle of that whole like supply chain thing that's almost over. We're getting there." And I was like, "Crap, what do I do?" Um, and I was like, "Have you ever thought about thought leadership?" And his ears kind of perked up, and I was like, "All right, so get this right." I was like, what if we had, like, what everyone's doing webinars right now, right? And webinars are okay, but to me, they're kind of boring. I have a really short attention span, right? So I was like, what if we took this webinar idea, but filmed it as a talk show? So you would come in and you would be on a stage with other people. We have like full talk show production quality. Because at the time I was watching um, Kevin Hart's talk show and I had always wanted to do a talk show. But it was never the right time. And I was like, this is my moment. We're going to do this right now, right? So uh, we're chatting about it. And I was like, yeah, so we could do it two different ways. We could do it one way where we film it and it goes through post-production, right? So like a typical talk show would be we could add in B-roll and all this other stuff to the on the back end to make it look more polished. But I was like, you want leads. How about we do it live, right? And so we had a Next Up premiere, which was the one that went through post-production. Then we had Next Up Live. 
in Next Up Live, we actually have a moderator that's on stage. And this person would be connected to all the people that are watching. Honestly, it was throughout the world. We had people mostly in the U.S., obviously, but there were a bunch in Europe that are watching and in the islands in Jamaica, like all over the place watching these talks for episodes. But what's neat is like being a, a virtual viewer, you were able to drop in messages into the chat, which would then get relayed through the moderator to the people on stage. So they were able to communicate back and forth, which, which added a really neat dynamic. But on top of that, because it was live, we were able to do um, registrations and then attendee lists and all that stuff that we could then pass along to the sponsors. So uh, that was actually a, that was a pretty cool save. And, I, and, and thank you, Tyson, for, <laughs> for inspiring me to, to get that right. idea. But that has even um, evolved into like we're constantly evolving. So like you ask about First Tasty being if we're still doing it. Yeah, we are. We actually did a live episode um, at the Wisconsin School Nutrition Association as their closing keynote. And we had the we had a we had some broker chefs that were there. We had food service operators. We had the chef for the Green Bay Packers. We, we did a big cooking competition okay. from the live episode. That was a lot of fun. And that was a, a live version of First Taste TV. But now we're even doing like from the show floor live too, because instead of people coming into like a studio to record their from the show floor episode, like we can actually now go into their booths at these trade shows and film it live there. So now we have some of those out. And then with Next Up, we were at we were in Illinois. Was that last month? I think it was last month. And we filmed a live episode of Next Up as their closing keynote where we spoke about um, uh, sustainability. So we had... Three companies come in. We had Fork Farms. We had Deeply Rooted and Daring. And I just had a conversation in front of their audience as a closing keynote about sustainability. And um, what's neat, though, is with the next up episodes, those are actually all going to be on broadcast TV. Some of them have already started airing. So now we're partnering with a company with an organization called Biz TV. And um, we have a strip. like So we're literally on TV now, which has been really, really neat. So they put it on their broadcast platform and on their uh, internet TV platform, streaming platform as well. I feel like you, we're having this conversation right now and you're like on the, the brink of just blowing up and, and, and 10xing your business, which is really cool, man. That's that's exciting. And I mean, it, just everything that you're doing too, it, it just sounds, one, it sounds from the outside really fun. Um, and then also to just, there's a lot of people in the food industry that are constantly trying to build like a LinkedIn following. Like in what I do, people want that B2B connection. And when you have the talk show and you, you're live from the show floor and you do the, the digizine, like you're just creating so much content, which is a lot of times the hardest time building a following on social media. For you, how do you typically market your events and your shows to people? Yeah. So obviously a lot of it is on social media because if you have to be on social media, right? But um, I guess we, we kind of have an advantage because we have a publication too. So we can use our publication to market and our publication goes out to, gosh, our contact list is 90,000 people. If we're talking food service, we have like 55,000 people that we send to in the K-12 world and the rest wow. is like hospitals and, and uh, restaurants and like all that non-com space too and commercial. So we kind of have an advantage with that. Um, but honestly, it's just building relationships. So we're, we're big on combined network influencing, right? So we do a lot of sponsored content. So we tag our sponsors and then we share it, they reshare it, their friends share it. So it's a, it's really a lot of um, social media and then email blasts and publications. And we've been really fortunate to build a relationship with a company called Informa. Um, they're, they're the ones that are over... Nation's Restaurant News and Food Management Magazine, or actually Food Management Digizine, because now we actually help them produce that. Um, and the Create Conference, which is coming up uh, in a couple months. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to cross promote each other. And they're this mega company. They're huge. Like they're the ones that bought National Restaurant Association and all that um, this past May. So working with strategic partners like them. Uh, people like the Urban School Food Alliance as well, Institute of Child Nutrition, School Nutrition Association, like all these, all these people, all these organizations I've built relationships and partnerships with. And we just kind of cross promote each other and we grow together because what's the point of competing with people when you can work together and get some place that you get, get some place together that you couldn't go by yourself, you know? 
Yeah, that's right. Have you ever had someone approach you and just say, could you do all this for me? Could you set up a, a talk show? Could you, uh, you know, create live videos on a food show floor and essentially run that part of my business for me? Uh, I've never had someone ask me to run that part of the business for them, but we do a lot of white labeling stuff. So some of the things out there right now is um, we're working with Ventura Foods and Nation's Restaurant News and Menu Masters. And we've been doing um, the Menu Master 360 video series where we're traveling around talking to really successful chefs and doing a day in the life of chef like Preston Clark. He was the first episode that came out up at Lure Fish Bar in New York. Um, so that's purely white labeled. Like that doesn't have next to anything on it. We're doing that for Menu Masters and Nation's Restaurant News. Um, we've also done, I'm trying to think, uh, we produce podcasts for School Nutrition Association. We're on season two, just recorded that. Um, but I've never actually like taken over that arm of someone's business, but I'm not saying that I wouldn't. And that kind of sounds like fun. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. (laughs) I don't know anybody necessarily, but I think there's a lot of people out there, especially through the pandemic. It was a time for people to kind of tinker around and and try posting on LinkedIn or social media platforms for the first time ever in their life. And, you know, I I think some people stuck with it, a lot fizzled out, but I think there's still a lot of people that, that think I really want to be in this. I don't know how to be in this. Could I just outsource it to somebody like yourself who, you know, you have the connectivity, you have the know, the know how, and, and you have the business savvy to run it and make it look professional. Yeah. And I mean, I would love to help people help organizations do that. But at the same time though, like if it's something that you're interested in, but you just haven't done it yet, you can do it. Like I had no idea how to do any of this. Like people always say, fake it till you make it. Well, I believed it till I achieved it. Right. Um, So you just got to take small steps in the right direction. And I learned that from a mentor or from a friend slash mentor named Joe Urban. He was like, all you have to do is take small steps in the right direction and you'll get to where you're meant to be. But you just got to put yourself out there. Very true. You know, with this podcast, I had the same exact mentality when we started it up last year. It was, you know, you do one episode every week and next thing you know, you wake up and it's two years down the road. You've somehow built a following and it's gained traction, but it takes just one step at a time. Uh, yep. I think it's also important too when, for people that are trying new things, start with the, the most minimal viable product you can just put out there. You know, my first podcast episode was a good, you know, one to 10, it'd probably be like a three. Um, but over time, they've slowly gotten better and better and better and, and, the, and the show has matured. And I think like, it sounds like with your business as well, or just anything in life, it just takes one foot in front of the other. Yeah, exactly. You started off at a three and you get to a four, then a five, then a six. You just keep getting better and better and just practice. All it takes is reps. Like whether you're in, like, you know, you work in sales, it's all about getting in the reps in front of the, in front of the potential client or the customer, right? Well, same thing with everything else in life. It's got to put in the work and you'll get to where you, you're meant to be. Absolutely. Now, have you ever considered a, like a live event, like a, like a trade show of your own? Because it sounds like you have a pretty captive audience. You know, you said you mentioned you're sending out your publications to 90,000 people. That's a huge audience. Have you ever considered something live where you get everybody together? Man, are you like in my head right now or something? So we actually (laughs) have considered that. Um, We're actually planning for it. (laughs) Uh, We haven't really spoken about it too publicly yet because everything is not set in stone yet. But, you know, what the heck, I'm I'm here. Why not? So, uh, So speaking of national events, we've actually started doing private events. So I'll go there first, right? So um, I got this idea from Tyson too before I even started my company. So I was invited to, it was a Tyson and Alto Sham user group. um, And they brought in a bunch of different uh, food service directors. We were in Charleston at this one, right? And I was still working in sales for this other company. I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. People are here. They're having a good time. They're learning a lot. It's interactive. But I would do it a little bit differently, right? Because I'm always like trying to innovate. So, and theirs was amazing. So it, it truly inspired me. So when I got to the position of, of understanding like how to think as an operator, an industry member, and then now being this new entity thing, hybrid company that I am now, um, I was like, I need to find a way to bring people together. And one of my one of my good friends, 
uh, Lincoln Yee from International Food Solutions, he was like, Marlon, you need to find a way to to uh, build revenue off of your relationships. And I was like, it kind of sounds sleazy. And he was like, no, no, no. He was like, you're the guy that always knows somebody. Like people want to know who you know. So build a business around it and help people out, help make connections, right? And I was like, all right, cool. That's, that's kind of like sales. I can do that. Um, so we had this idea. We call it the Next Gen Summit. And what we do is um, we leverage the Next Gen Network relationships, our email list, our following, our user influence, and all that to put together um, networking events for 10 to 30 operators, decision makers from across the country for a specific host, specific company, right? So let's say like you come to me, you're like, hey, I want to do like a plant tour on this day. I'm going after this audience in this neck of the woods or open it up to everybody, but get me like 20 people there that um, I would want to meet. So we go out and we find the 20 people, we bring them to your facility and then we do um, facility tour because that's always fun. But we also provide professional development because that is key for getting school food service professionals in specific um, to be able to travel. So we're providing them with the CEUs they need to keep their credentials and their jobs. And then we do networking also and you get to do like, a, you know, educate and build relationships. Right. So th that's probably our newest solution. And um, we've done four or five so far. Right. I know the fifth one's coming up, coming up in, in October. And it's interesting because I'll, I'll talk to some of my clients that have done this before. And one of them, AmTab, who's done pretty much everything we've offered. And there, I asked him, I was like, well, what's, what's, what service for you do you get the most bang for your buck? Like, where is the return coming? And he was like, right out the gate, hands down, next and summits, because he's getting to rub elbows with incredibly influential, successful decision makers. And not only is, are they learning from, from these companies? But these companies are learning from them because they have this captive audience of 20 people and the ideas and the suggestions that are coming from these decision makers are worth paying for. Right. So we started off with that. Um, and then we also have this big event called Ignite that we do. Um, so we did it for the second year um, this past uh, July 9th. It was in Denver, Colorado at ANC. And uh, that for us is like this big celebration of everything that every, everyone has done, right, this past year. Um, we give away awards, you know, we, we, there's lots of food, there's dancing, it's a really good time. So we have those two different things, right? Then I was like, you know what? I was like, we do all these cool digital, provide these cool digital solutions. And now we're getting into events. And we also have um, our foot in the door in the non-commercial space why don't we just do a fully non-commercial event and then we can call it like the next gen summit. So we're actually looking at doing that next year. Um, we did sign a contract with a hotel in Orlando, um, but we're still planning things out. And for me, that's meant to be like the culmination of food service, non-commercial coming together because I keep hearing that a lot of innovation comes from outside of K-12 food service into K-12, which is true, totally true. But at the same time, though, no one in the restaurant world, I don't think in one single restaurant is feeding as many mouths as they do in these school districts. Like we're talking like hundreds of thousands of meals a year. Like it's crazy how much how much the how many kids they feed. So I That's feel right. like in terms in term of, um, of like processes and efficiencies and all that stuff, like there are things that can be taken away, taken outside of K-12 and implemented in other spaces, whether it's in a restaurant or in a hospital or even in a jail. Like there's tons of places that are serving lots of meals and there's a lot to learn from K-12 as well. But, you know, me, like I like to do things differently. And like I said, I have a horrible memory intention span. So like when I go to a conference and I sit in a breakout session, I don't care who you are or what you're talking about. I'm probably going to get distracted, right? Um, so I was like, well, how can we do this better? And I was like, well, you know, we're, we're next to network. We do a lot of production. Uh, why don't we have every breakout session be a quote unquote studio session? And whether it's a first taste TV episode or a next up episode, you're actually coming in and like you're filming content, like your educational session is actually a TV show in front of a live studio audience where you're going to capture everything. 
We're going to provide you with a post-produced uh, product, and then we're going to put it inside of a digizine with all sorts of takeaways um, for everybody that attends. So, yes, we are going to do our own show. Um, it's, it's supposed to happen next year. I keep saying supposed to, but now it has to happen because we signed the contract. Right, I'm you're just in now. Some sponsors. <laughs> But yeah, so it's I'm really excited about that because like we're not out there to compete with anybody. We just want to help, right? And I know there's a ton of conferences out there right now, whether you're in, in K12, outside of K12, you know, whatever it is. But I feel like there is enough room for everybody. And I don't know if anyone's doing anything like the way we're doing it. At the same time, like if you're doing something similar and you want to work with us, great. Let's let's work together on this because I could use the help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I had a, a guest on the, on, on the podcast uh, a few months ago. His name is Scott Embringham, and he had built a business. Uh, it was a successful business. And one day he lost his four or five biggest clients and his business went down near to zero. And he had a mentor at the time. And the guy said, you're not solving enough problems for people. So he started to talk to his clients and other people that he had serviced and said, what else can I do for you to help with your business? And over time he went, he shot back up to $10 million in sales. I think he did in 18 wow. months, which was pretty impressive. And I've always taken that. It sounds like that's something you're doing is solving a lot of problems for people. Yeah. Um, I just love to serve. Um, I want to help. Uh, I, it's funny, whenever we did the first season of First Taste TV, at that point, I was still immature and learning, and I'm still learning a lot daily. But I feel like at that time, it was always like, ooh, we want a talk show. We want to be on TV. We want this. We want that. Yada, yada, yada. And then after that first season, like, it was a success. But I was like, no, like, I was, we were looking at this entire wrong way. Like, if we are going to survive, especially in a time like this, it's not what's in it for me. It's like, how can I help you? Because that is the only way to truly grow a business in a authentic way that matters. I believe like it's, it needs to be about other people. Um, and I've never been someone that's like all about the money. I mean, yeah, like we need money. I got to feed, feed my family. And I do like, I do like nice toys, but at the same time, like I'm not doing this for money. Like I genuinely want to help people succeed. And that's always been my model. Like everybody else first and I'll come after. I love that. You seem like a guy who would have like a, a big pie in the sky goal, you know, like a, what do they call a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, something that you want to achieve professionally. What is that? If there is something. <laughs> Man, you are good at this. You're asking all the right questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, so I do. Uh, so ultimately, I personally and the majority of my team, if not all of them, we want to further God's kingdom, right? Like we're all a bunch of Christians running this company called NextGen Network. And that is the thing that we're doing now to get us to where we want and go later, which is to ultimately have a nonprofit and then further God's kingdom. So I would love to do that in the way of a documentary, right? So I think it would be awesome to travel around the world and film a documentary on food insecurities and um, uh, the, the impact of food on culture and culture on food, essentially. So... Uh, the idea is to film this documentary, but every community that we go to, we leave it a better place, whether that is from providing housing because they, their food insecurity is built or is, is due to no houses, or if their insecurity is caused by not having enough medicine, you want to provide medicine, or if they just don't have you know access to produce, like if they have the infrastructure, let's give them a hydroponic tower or let's help them create a farm, do something like that. So that is my uh, my big pie in the sky that I'm going after. And I mean, that sounds like a lot of fun, right? Like traveling around the world, filming a documentary, telling stories, highlighting other, making the world a better place. Like, sign me up. I'm in. <laughs> I, I'm sure it has its challenges, but right now they're not coming to my mind. I, I think that'd be a lot of fun to go do. I guess yeah. the question it would be, when when would you want to do that um i would do it tomorrow if i could but okay. like with all great products or solutions or services you need you need great people um and support so as of right now we're currently still building up the team um i've had a mul multiple conversations with some some uh, companies that were in or interested in sponsoring something like this um 
but that's just such a big thing that we haven't done before. So th that's like my three to five year goal. Um, I could see us start to take some real steps towards it in 2024. Um, but everyone I talk to is, is interested, but you know, like with the world that we live in, it just takes money. So we got to find, we got to either generate the money um, through fundraising, because I would like to do it as a nonprofit. Um, and then, uh, or, you know, we'll just figure it out. It's just really, really funding. And along with that too, I do think it'd be important. I have had some conversations about doing a documentary here in the States about school food service and what that really looks like, because when I first got into school food, like it blew my mind. I did not know it was all that it is. Um, and I don't know that anybody has really told the full story, like an unbiased story, um, like where we talk to, you know, food service operators in school districts at large and small districts. And we talk to the major associations and the major alliances and educational groups and industry and all that until in the USDA, which plays a big hand in it and tell that full story of what's really happening and going on and talk about all the things that these food service directors have overcome in the past and all the things that they're going to have to overcome in the future too. I think it'd be a really cool story. I'd like to do that too. Yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds like it's one is needed. Um, mm -hmm. I think there does need to, there, there should be an unbiased story of school nutrition and, you know, especially around the K-12 space. I think they, um, there's a lot of, information that's not being told that should be being, mm -hmm. uh, told out there. Yeah. And I think overall though, I mean, like I know they have, we have our challenges, but it's a positive story. I mean, we're feeding kids, like we're literally feeding kids. How can that not be positive? <laughs> there are challenges exactly. out there, but they always get overcome. That's right. I, I'm curious, you know, you seem like someone who is comfortable taking risks and taking leaps of faith. Why is that? Um, taking risks has always, that, that's not true for the past, since I was 33, taking risks has just been like fun to me. Um, I don't know what it is. Like, I'm not even like a, like a thrill seeker. Like I'm not diving out of airplanes or anything, but I mean, if I'm going to be real, it's just going back to my faith. Like, I feel like I'm here for a reason. Um, I've seen things happen in my life that should have never happened. Like I, there should have been no possible way. I should have been able to move from Tampa to North Augusta, South Carolina. Like it, like, no, I don't know how I got that house, right? It was crazy. Um, and there's just been so many other things that have happened to me that have, you know, solidified my faith. Like I have this mission. I'm going to stay on the path. I'm going to make mistakes. That's okay. But the heart's in the right place. I'm going to follow who I'm supposed to follow. And things just always happen to work out. It's the wildest thing. So it's like, when I take a risk, like, it wasn't a risk. I knew I was going to be successful. Like not to say it in a cocky way or anything, but to me, I've already won and I'm going to continue to win if I continue, you know, serving my God and helping people who I'm supposed to. So. I love that. Since you started your company, what are some, do you have any new beliefs or behaviors or habits that you've adapted since then? Yeah. Um, new habits. Uh, I guess. I'm really, I'm really particular about being as proactive with my health as much as I can, because I know that if I don't, if I don't get my workout in and normally in the morning, I'm leaving myself open for potential stress. Now I'm not, I'm not someone that gets stressed. I think if you ask anybody about me, like I'm never stressed, but I think that's partially, it's partially genetic, but then also because I'm super proactive about building up that stress buffer. So when things happen that would just like break somebody, I'm like, Oh, you know, it's no big deal. Right. Like we'll, we'll get through it. Um, so I try and stay healthy because if I'm not healthy, the company's not healthy. And if I, the company's not healthy, I can't provide for my family. So, uh, gym routine is strong. Um, I think that I've gotten better also about keeping an inner circle. Whereas like I'm a people person. I love to have like everybody in my circle, but I need like an inner circle, like people that I could actually like other business owners that are like minded that I can go to and be like, Hey, this is what I'm dealing with. Give me your thoughts. I mean, this happened, you know, last this past weekend, um, I reached out to my good friend, uh, Kayla Byer over at deeply rooted. And I was like, well, she was, she actually checked in on me. Um, and I was like, Hey, like I'm dealing with this, this and this. And she picked up the phone right away and she called me and we talked it through and that was like, that was great. So 
uh, keeping uh, some really, really smart, caring people in your corner. Um, that's been great for me. Uh, I think one of the biggest lessons too that I've learned is you can't be everything for everyone as much as you want to be. Um, and this was especially difficult for me when I first started the company too, because like I'm just throwing things at the wall, right? Like we're in the pandemic. I got to, I got to find some way to, to bring in some revenue, right? So I was just trying out new ideas left and right. But then I got myself in a situation with a dear friend of mine where I, I probably overpromised, and uh, it was like we were we were literally both building our businesses at the same time. Um, and there were some things like I was trying to do because she was my friend and I wanted to help her. And I'm like, I'm always there for my friends, but I feel like if I would have said no, hey, sorry, I I can't do this for you because I'm doing all these other things, or I can't do this to this scale. Maybe I could do it at this scale to help you out. That would have um, helped avoid some challenging times that we faced. Like we're we're great now. But it's hard to say no to people that you care about. And that's always my challenge because for me, business isn't just business. People always say never say it, but it's personal to me. Like it truly is personal. Like I genuinely care about these people. Um, so learning to say no to some things and say yes to other things is probably something, probably the biggest lesson that I've learned. And it's so difficult for me even today. Like it's it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> totally. I I, I can sympathize with that. I started an Airbnb business prior to COVID. And when COVID hit, I had to get rid of that Airbnb. And it really was a blessing in disguise because the focus, I was, I had diverted focus between the Airbnb business and my normal broker business. And my normal broker business suffered from, because of it, because I couldn't give my full attention to it. I was constantly worried about what's happening at the units that I had. And so thankfully, that business went away. And then my food broker business just absolutely skyrocketed after that. Um, and I really started to learn entrepreneurship, but I feel like I needed that Airbnb business to the lessons I learned from it and finding that it is okay to say no to people. And I need to, you know, stick to my core competencies. Don't deviate from that. You know, the, they do say the riches are in the niches, which is, uh, something that mm -hmm. I definitely believe in for sure. Yeah, that's very true. It's very true. If you had the attention of the entire food service industry for just five minutes, what would you say? Man, that's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what would I say if I had attention of everybody in food service? Um, I don't know that I would have anything to tell them, really. I would want to hear from them. Like, I want to know, like, what their needs are, like, what kind of support. I'm sorry to hear my dog <laughs> snoring in the background. No problem. Um, but no, I, I, <laughs> I would want to ask them, how can I help and people like me help? Like, what are your biggest struggles? But then I would follow that up with, like, tell me something that you're proud of. Like, I want to hear their success stories. I want to share the, the success stories because food service isn't easy. It's not an easy line of work. There's late hours, like early mornings. Like, it's a ton to deal with. I personally am not cut out to work in the food service. I just couldn't do it, right? Um, but I feel like there's a lot of other individuals out there that are maybe just getting into it or maybe just starting their own restaurant or chain or they're jumping into a franchise and they just need to hear that what they do is good and they can do it. It's going to be difficult, but they can do it. And here are the things that you can do to help set you up for success. I love that. Very well said. Well, Marlon, I, I just want to say thank you so much again for taking time out of your day to meet with me and just really cool to see all the different things you got going on and what you've been able to build and create for not just yourself, but uh, for your family uh, and the people that you work with truly inspiring. And I know your story is going to resonate with a lot of people listening. So I just wanted to say thank you, uh, for, for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. It was a blessing being on here. And, um, like all the cool things that we're doing, like shout out to my team because without the team, none of this would happen. Um, and of course, you know, uh, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> for making That's this right. all making this all work for me. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it was great being on the podcast. And you know what? I think I need to have you on my podcast. One of I'd love days. to. So we could, uh, we could flip things around and, and do it that I'm way. in for that anytime. You just let me know. All right, cool. Appreciate that. All right, man. Thanks so much. Anytime. Thank you.